grace. One of the most powerful things in the world. One of the most misunderstood things in our spiritual life. And I want us to grab a hold of grace. It's hard to do so because we cannot see it. I can see this water bottle. I know everything about it. But grace is something I read about and I hear about, but I can't wrap my mind around what grace truly is. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your app today, turn to Romans chapter 6, verse number 1. We're going to read just a couple of Scripture, and we're going to look at grace for just a few minutes this morning. Grace is that thing that has changed my life tremendously. In John chapter 6, verse number 1, finally when I began to realize what Paul was talking about when he talked about grace. So I'd like to read a few verses, and we have them up here on the screen. I'd like to read verse number 1 and verse number 2. Paul's writing to the church at Rome, and he says to them, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of how wonderful his grace is? In verse number 2, Paul said, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? And I want to talk about this verse today. These two verses, they are so powerful. Notice the quote that's going up on the screen. Philip Yancey said this about grace. Grace is the most perplexing and powerful force in the universe. And I believe the only hope for our twisted, violent planet. He says it's perplexity and powerful. And I'd like to break this down today because he's absolutely right. The perplexity of grace. What is it all about? We talk about grace. We sing grace. When something happens in America and a great trial comes upon the American people, the first thing we do is we pull out amazing grace. Bagpipes are playing it. We sing grace. We like to receive grace. And once in a while, we will share grace with other people. Probably not often, but sometimes we do. So many years, I could not wrap around my mind what the grace was all about. I just couldn't do it. And yet I wanted to wrap it around my mind so grace could become a reality in my life. It's taken a lot. How is grace received? How is it accepted? How is it lived? How is it extended to other people? And I hope at the end of this message today that I can put a face on grace. So when you walk out of here today, you can say, yes, I can see grace, the reality of it in my own personal life. First of all, let's look at the perplexity of grace. The word perplexity simply means something that we cannot understand, something that we cannot deal with, that we're puzzled and we're confused. The perplexity of grace. We are confused about grace in America today. And I'll point that out in just a few moments. We're puzzled about what grace truly is. The Roman Christians were perplexed. Listen to what they said. Shall we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? That's what they were thinking. Well, hey, man, let's just keep on sinning. Wow, we can do anything we want to do. This is going to be fun. God's grace. There it is. God's grace. Let's keep on sinning. But they did not understand the perplexity of grace. God's grace was never given so that we could just keep on sinning. That's what's happening in America today. Our problem in America today isn't because of two political systems, because they're all messed up. Not because of a man or woman that's going to be in the office. The problem in America that we have accepted sin. And our culture is living in sin today. And that's the problem. Because we think that God's grace is going to cover everything that we do. And the fact of the matter is, that is a truth. But they were perplexed about what grace really was. 
This is where we get in trouble in our own personal life and in our relationships. We just think that God just wants to show us His grace. And the best way He can do that is for Al to just go out and sin and sin and sin. That's what we think, oftentimes. But let me remind you today that sin is a terrible thing in our lives. Sin is very painful. So it may be fun for a season. That's what the book of Hebrews says. There's pleasure in sin for a season. And believe me, it will only be for a season. Sin is very, very painful. And it leaves a scab and it leaves a scar on our lives. And it hurts. Oh, is it fun? Of course. If it wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. Sin is fun. Well, I could do it. God's grace is going to cover me. But sin will leave a pain and a scar on your life forever. Someone has said, sin will take you farther than you planned on going. It'll keep you longer than you planned on staying. And it will cost you more than you planned on paying. Think about that. I've been down that road. Sin took me further than I had planned on going. And sin kept me longer than I had planned on staying. And sin cost me more than what I planned on paying. Sin. And so what Paul is talking about here is yes, the grace of God covers sin. Yes, it does. But that is not the whole purpose of the grace of God. You know, I think one of the reasons why it's so perplexed in our minds is this. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And so I think, well, I got saved here, and God forgave me of my sins, and I'm going to heaven. And so when I think of grace, I think, well, I'm saved here, and I'm going to heaven someday. It's all going to be great. Well, the fact of the matter is, God's grace was given to us to live in that period between those two. I'm going to heaven someday, but heaven isn't everything about what grace is about. Every once in a while I hear people say, man, I just can't wait to go to heaven. I can. I can. I can wait. Loretta Lynn had a song not long ago, a few years ago, that was something like, uh, everybody's talking about going to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> How true that is. Yeah, I like living, don't you? Are you wanting to die today? No. And so heaven is a reality in the future. But I want to know what grace is going to do for me today, on this day. And let me take you through some steps that I think are so very important. And some things that I've experienced in my own personal life concerning sin. The problem is, it gets us in his grip. And we find ourselves in bondage to sin. And we can't get out of the grip. It's like we're in some kind of a bondage, in a straitjacket, and we can't get out of it. That's what sin does. And the reason sometimes we find ourselves in this position is because we want to be in charge. We want to be in control. We want to fix things. We want to fix ourselves. We want to fix our spouse. We want to fix our children. We want to fix every church member. We want to fix our pastor. We want to fix everybody on the job. And we just want to fix everybody because we want to be in control. And so we go about trying to fix people. And I found out a long time ago, I've been counseling for years, going on 50 years. And one thing I've always told people that come in for counseling is this. I can help it. I can give you a plan. But there's one thing I cannot do. I cannot fix you. It's just impossible. I cannot fix another person. I can't even fix myself. And I'm working on that pretty hard. 
But what happens? We try to be in control. We try to fix other people. I try to fix my wife, and my wife tries to fix me. And then the first thing you know, uh, we are trying to fix ourselves and fix other people. I want to put a quote up here that I think is so important. You can't fix yourself by breaking somebody else. And that's what happens. We try to fix ourselves, and when in the process of doing that, we break somebody else. It's usually our spouse or maybe our children. And then as we are in control and we're trying to fix everything and fix everybody, the first thing you know, sin begins, a pattern of sin begins in our life. We become bitter. We become unforgiving. Rage sets in. Anger sets in. Then there are harsh words said to each other. You have to watch those harsh words. Those words can enter into sin if we're not careful because they build upon the other things, the rage and the anger, the harsh words. And then the first thing you know, we become so bitter, then we have evil behavior begins to work out in our lives. We lie, we lust, we cheat. The first thing you know, we may have an affair, there's a divorce, and we just go on and on. And those are some things that we, that we uh, experience in life. But then there's other sins in our life that we don't want to talk about. Most of us sitting in our churches, the gossip, the evil speaking of other people, the unforgiveness that we have in our hearts, those things that go in our mind, I just wished I could kill them, you know. I know I'm just talking about myself. Okay, don't, don't worry about it. I'm not talking about it. But those things that go in our, in our minds, and so... Sin destroys us. And it's perplexing to think about grace. Yes, grace will cover that sin. But listen to what he said. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. How can I continue in sin? just so God's grace could abound. That's not the purpose of grace. And I'd like to share with you the purpose of grace today, the power of grace. I do not have to live in sin. Let me ask you a question. Why would I want to live in sin? Why would I want all the pain? Why would I want the agony of sin? There's going to be sin once in a while pop up in your life. No doubt about that. But to live in sin. Why do I want to live in the drama of sin? That everything is chaos. And there's anger and there's rage. And, and uh, it uh, begins to cut away and then scars. And there's that pain. Why? Why would I want to live there? Because that's not where God wants me to live. God never ever intended to die upon the cross so that I could live in all the sin I ever wanted to live in. He died upon the cross so I could live a wonderful life, a life that empty of as much sin as possible so that I could enjoy life, I could have tranquility, I could have joy and peace in my life. That's why he come to die. Not that I could sin, but you see, they didn't understand what grace was about. And the reason for that is that you cannot really define it like you can define this glass that I have before me. So in verse number two, the power of grace, Paul said, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live any longer in it? I don't know where your life is today. I've traveled a lot of life. What I'm preaching to you today, I lived a lot of it. I've got the scars. I've got the pain. I had the cost. It cost you dearly. I, I, don't, uh, I don't deny that. I've been there. I've been down that road. I went down that road when I was a teenager. And I thought uh, life was just a bunch of fun. I'd get off my crowd and, and could very well have become an alcoholic myself, drinking a pint of vodka almost every night when I was a teenager. 
staying up all night, crowding around, doing things that were putting a scar upon me. I lived with that constantly. There was a time when I was under the influence and slapped my wife. See, that's what sin does. You think I'm proud of that? I'm not proud of that. Almost cost me my marriage. Probably should have. Not only am I thankful for the grace of God, I'm thankful for her grace. So you do things when you're living in sin and it, it hurts. It leaves a scar. Pastor Bruce and I stand up here and you probably think we live just this lily white life. It's hard. We understand sometimes what people's going through. That's why we have a listening ear because we've been down that road. I lived there. I thought, well, you know, I grew up in a little country church. Got saved when I was eight years old. Ah, God's grace will take care of me. Man, I got saved when I was eight. I'm going to heaven someday. I can do what I want to do. And I tried it. And it backfired. The cost is high. And there'll be things in your mind you'll never get out of your mind because of what you might have done. But that's not what God's grace is for. God's grace was to help me get out of that condition and to become something that God wanted me to become. Somebody that could understand life. Instead of doing to my wife what I did is to love her dearly. And to show that to her. And God's grace brings you to that point. I'm going to put a number of quotes up here on the uh, screen about grace. And so look at them. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. But it kind of tells a little bit what grace is about. Grace is like water. It flows to the deepest point. I don't care where you may be today. Grace will flow there to you. I love that. That's how powerful it is. It'll flow to the lowest point. The second one is this. Grace is not simply leniency when we have sin. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. That's what grace is for, not to sin. Grace is for me not to sin. It's a power within me not to sin. That's God's plan. It's not a leniency when we have sin. It's an enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just a pardon. Quote from John Piper. Grace is a power, not just a pardon. The third one is this. God's grace is not an excuse to sin. It is not an excuse to sin. It is a reason to overcome sin. And Lamott said, grace meets us where we are but does not leave us where it found us. Aren't you glad for that? Wow. <laughs> it, it found me, didn't leave me there, took me on a journey, the power of grace in my life, not to live in sin any longer. Now I have the power not to live in sin. That's what grace does. Doesn't leave you where it finds you. The next quote, Tim Keller. The more you see your own flaws and sins, the more precious, electrifying, and amazing God's grace appears to you. And how true that is. I'm going to give you a quote up here. And I'm going to go through it with you. Okay? God has fixed a fix to fix your fix. When he talked about God... Wants to fix our fix. Now, we want to fix our fix. We think that we can do it. We think we have power. So here it is. God has fixed the fix to fix the fix, but you don't accept the fix to fix the fix, so God fixes another fix to fix the fix. Got that? Very profound. Don't you think? That's Schuessler theology right there. It's not in the Bible. But that little quote right there was part of the reason why I've become what I am today. Because I was trying to fix life. I was trying to fix my life. I couldn't get the job done. I lived a year in depression. I tried to fix it. I tried to get out of it. 
It was impossible. I tried everything in the world until God came along. God had a fix to fix the fix. I finally accepted the fix to fix the fix. But God still has other fixes to fix other fixes that I need. Okay? Now here's what I'm talking about. We want to fix things. And that's human. And we think we can do it. Because we're pretty great. We're pretty smart. We're Americans. Educated. We can fix anything. Well, how's that going, America? <laughs> Not quite sure. When you get to the place, when you realize you can't fix yourself, I can't fix my wife, I can't fix my children, I can't fix church members, I can't fix people I work with, you finally get to the place where you turn it loose and let God fix the fix. What God does, his grace meanders through your soul, through your life, through your inner person. And he knows your greatest need. And he knows what needs to be fixed in your life more than even what you know. And he is constantly, moment by moment, fixing a fix to fix your fix. But if you're not careful, you won't accept that fix to fix the fix. But God won't leave you alone because he'll fix another fix to fix the fix. And we're like salmon. You know, we'll, sw we'll swim downstream of God, and we say, oh, God, you're just so great. I just love what you did in my life, God. Got to go to church today and sing and hear preaching and be with my brothers and sisters, and things are just so great. Then all of a sudden, something comes up in our life, and, and uh, it's, it gets painful. And we say, you know, God, I think I've about had enough with you. And we start swimming upstream. We're going the other way until we get things a little better, and then we start going back downstream. Isn't that the way Christian life goes? That's kind of the way mine has gone down through the years. God has fixed a fix. You've got to accept this. You've got to understand this. To fix whatever it is in our lives, whatever it is that you're dealing with today, and I'm dealing with, there's only one person that can fix my fix, and that is God Almighty through the grace of God. I can try as much as I want to. But I want to tell you something. The more I try to fix things in myself and my wife and my children, then I get angry. Then I get upset. And all these things start going through my mind. And then I have these feelings within me. God wants to fix the fix. I want to put a face on grace before we finish out today. I um, had a terrible time trying to um, wrap my mind around grace and I haven't even comprehended it yet. Hope before I die someday I'll understand it more. See, God looks through your crust. He looks through the scab. He looks through your scars. God knows exactly who you are. And maybe you've got things going on in your life, and maybe sin is really rampant in your life, and you can't get out of the grip. And, and God knows. He looks down inside you, and he knows who you are, and he knows what you can be and what you can become. And he wants that for your life. And we don't fool him. He's working in our life, and he's fixing a fix. And he wants to fix that fix. He wants us to accept it. And if we don't accept it, he'll fix another one, I guarantee you. He won't let up on you. The face, the face of grace. John chapter 1, verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. And Jesus Christ is a personification of grace. You want to know what grace looks like? You look in the face of Jesus Christ and you've just seen grace. Because the Bible says he is full of grace. That's the face of grace. That's the reality. It's all about him. 
about the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what we just looked at this morning. This amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Do you see? Do you see what grace is? Do you really see? God didn't provide grace for us so that we could just sin and sin and continue to live in sin. He provided grace for us so we could get out of sin and get out of it and live a life that is worth living. A life of holiness and righteousness, not a life of sin. That's what grace is all about. The power to release sin and to make us what God would have us to be. That's the story of grace. You understand why Philip Yancey in his quote said, grace is the most perplexing and the most powerful force upon the universe. It's hard to understand. But it's got great power to move our lives, to change our lives. I do not know where I would be today if the grace of God had not changed me from where I was. Oftentimes, would think that I probably wouldn't be married to her. There might have been a possibility to end up in prison. Because some of the things that I was doing, living in sin. I'm so grateful that I can share with you today the wonderful grace of God. And yet I still need his grace. We've been teaching grace in my class on Sunday morning, 9.30. We just finished it up. And one of the ladies in our class today said, you know, I think God's grace is really working my life. She said, I used to, she said, I, I used to like this gangster rap. And everybody started laughing, gangster rap. And she said, I heard something the other day and said, I kind of wanted to just turn it off. I don't like that stuff anymore. And I, gangster rap. And I, they're all laughing. Oh, yeah, I like gangster rap. I had to get my phone out and Google that. What in the world is gangster rap? <laughs> I guess that must be something that, you know, I grew up back in the 40s and 50s. And so gangster rap. I tell you, we spent the whole class laughing, or they did anyhow. I don't know if they was laughing at gangster rap or me. I'm not quite sure what it was. <laughs> but it was funny anyhow. Justin, why don't you come up here, would you? And we're just going to have a little time if, um, if you need to come up and pray or maybe say, God, I'm kind of tired of sin. I'm tired of all the drama. I'm tired of the heartache. I'm tired of the pain. I'm just, I'm just tired of I'm going to release it. I want to give it to you. I want your grace, God. I want you to show me how powerful your, your grace is this morning. I'm going to come and I'm just going to lay it there. I'm tired trying to fix things. I'm tired trying to fix other people. I'm wore out.